to Deccan Dialogues. This is a platform to critically examine various contemporary issues confronting our nation and impacting our lives. These issues could be social, political, or economic, and the effort is to focus our attention on alternative pathways. For such conversations, Deccan Dialogues attempts to bring experts and public intellectuals from across the world and from across the country. Through these dialogues, we wish to bring to our audiences on a regular basis a calm, informed, and nuanced analysis of the different issues that plague us. In this episode, we focus on a major irritant about the way we document, narrate, and recall our nation's collective history. Why is it that in the writing and telling of India's history, South India's distinct story has largely been ignored? Why does Indian history have to be focused only on the Indo-Gangetic plains? Why has the telling of history never crossed the Vindhyas to the south? South India has had a distinct language and culture for a long time. The Satavanas ruled for over 400 years, yet how many of us know about them? Why this historical amnesia, despite the mighty and industrious Satwahanas, Pallavas, Pandyas, Cholas, Cheras, Rashtrakutas, and so on, who ruled from the south and who left behind their indelible imprints on the sands of time? Was it willful neglect? Was it ignorance? Or was it just a lack of interest in the history of South India? and also the Northeast, both by Western and Indian scholars who concentrated largely on the dynasties of North India. Throwing some light on the history of the South that should make anyone proud are two public intellectuals today, Mohan Guruswami and Parkala Prabhakar. Both of them are trained economists and thinkers. Please feel free to leave your comments below and to hit the subscribe button. Over to Mohan Guruswami and Parakala Prabhakar. I was just thinking of, you know, this new government committee to write, rewrite the history. It's been there for seven years now. Mm -hmm. First thing they announced when they came was Smriti Rani was the HRD minister. And she said that I may not know much, but don't judge me by my lack of education but you judge me by the results. Now we've got seven years, we have not seen any results. In between, we had the Minister for Culture, Mr. Sharma, I don't think he's in the government now, who said that history will start with Ramayana, because that is also part of our history. Now, if you start with mythology, God knows how much more mythology you will have in that history. So I think, and we have not had any discussion in the public domain on that at all since then. As I see it, the history of India, you and I must have educated almost the same times, mostly the history of North India. That's right. We start with uh, Afghanistan, Bamiyan, Buddha's there, and you come, it ends somewhere in there, east of Pataliputra. That was the Gangetic Plain, in Indus and the Gangetic Plain. Gangetic Plain was Bharatvarsh. Now, beyond that we don't learn anything, nor are our children taught anything, nor is there general awareness, nor is there awareness that while North was being constantly subjugated by different invaders, so Central Asia, Afghanistan, Persia, where have you, even Xinjiang, because Kanishka came from the Sueshi clan in Xinjiang. So obviously, you know, you were a Tukarin. So he came to, and then became a Buddhist. We didn't notice them until they started coming as Muslims. The same people. Same cent central nations came as Rajputs, became Hindus, Agnikula, Kshatriyas. So it's fine with it. But when start, they started appearing as Muslims, then we started taking note, called it an invasion. Anyway, the story stops there in the Gangetic Plain. Nobody crossed south of the Vindhyas. First, 
Delhi centric ruler who might have come down south is Aurangzeb. Even Emperor Ashoka didn't come down. None of the Guptas came down. Kanishka tried to come down. Harshavardhan tried to come down. They got defeated by Ulakesin in at the Narmada. So our story is never told in the south. It is not even told to those people living outside the south. It was not told to us that each region has its own story to tell. So therefore, I keep wondering. Must we have the archaeological societies in all India, Survey of India as an all India organization, or must each state have its own archaeological survey to discover its past, to unearth its culture, to write its own history? After all, you know, we are supposed to be a, a composite of many nations. How can you subsume this history of many nations into one? A question which keeps bothering me. And I find that suddenly all things have gone quiet around. There's no rewriting of history. They don't talk about it. But we are seeing a trend towards what I call, you know, making India monochromatic. You know, based on Hindi, and which incidentally in East India Company language, concocted by them. There's no Hindi before 200 years ago. Yeah. We're all different dialects, Kariboli and Maithili and Prajbasha and all. So I see, I see some a new kind of a, a dusk descending on India. I wonder if you had any views like this, fears like I have on this here. Mohan, you are very right. You know, I am not a historian. Nor am I. But I am very concerned about history. And I have been a student of history. I have, I have uh, time and again, I, I go through uh, uh, historical treatises, I also looked up the CBSC syllabus. I looked up the NCRT books. I also looked at the course structures of various universities, both in the south as well as in the north, both public universities as well as private universities. All these observations truly bear out what you have been saying, that, you know, they are skewed. They are more focused on Aryavarta, both ancient history as well as uh, medieval history and of course modern history. I will come to that. I do not want, I want to enter a caveat here. I do not want to sound as though it is north versus south. It is not. As you said, it is every region. Let me illustrate this. We hardly know anything about the Northeast. You know, what the home uh, kingdom, home yeah. empire, you know, various other kingdoms in the, in the Northeast. And even our own students, our own people in the south of Vindhyas, who are fairly educated, they have no idea that, you know, we had an empire called Satavahana Empire. Yeah which extended from the banks of Krishna river, what is today called Amaravati, those days it was called Dhanya Kataka, Dhamma Kataka. Mm. From the banks of Krishna, it extended up to what is today called Afghanistan, mm. which then was called Gandhara. Mm. That was the extent of the empire. And it was an uninterrupted rule by a single dynasty for 400 years, from 200 BC to 400, 200 AD you know, uh, 400 years. And of course, you know, you had uh, starting from uh, Cheras to Cholas to Pandyas to Pallavas to Chalukyas and the various branches of Chalukyas, the Badami Chalukyas, the Eastern West Chalukyas, the, Eastern, the Western yeah. Chalukyas, the Vengi Chalukyas and then of course you had, uh, um, you know, Rashtrakutas, you have Ikshwakus, uh, you have Vishnukundins. Um, you know, all these kingdoms and dynasties, the Vijayanagara, Vijayanagara extended from Goa to Sri Lanka, mm. you know, these things are not in the historical imagination of, you know, the, 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 the modern India today. We are, we are uh, given, as you said, 
you know uh, the Mughals and then uh, the the Delhi Sultanate and you know uh, the Mauryas and then the, the Guptas. It it all centered around and that. the Rajputs and the and the Rajputs. Um, we are completely unaware of what is the 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 historical significance of the Northeast. Absolutely, the South Indian. Um, and look at the Chola's influence. You know, it, the, the trade routes extended up to uh, China. It traded with China. And and the influence, the cultural influence, not necessarily you know by arms, but cultural influence is Indonesia, Burma, and the entire uh, uh, Far Java, East, Sumatra, everything. Far Bali. East. So these are all completely you know out of the imagination of the Indian Indian historiography. Which, to my mind, is unfair, unfair, and 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 gives some kind of a room for a certain region to feel that they are very important in the in the history of India, and, it, and other parts are less significant, less important, unimportant, and insignificant. And that is validated today by the fact that the population, say. Gazetic states, UP and Bihar, together they are one quarter of India. Yes. Just two states. Yeah. Landmass they are small, mm. but pop density of population they are high, mm. and all their indices are low. Mm. They are always in the bottom two, mm. and politically they are the dominant areas of the country. Mm. So in a way, the people who should mm. not be writing our history are writing our history. Exactly. You know, uh, and. That weight is being felt on us socially, culturally. But but Mohan, I, I also and want you to I also want you to um, throw some light on why did this happen? You see, it happened basically because we emerged as a Delhi centric polity, except for the period when the British were ruling from Calcutta and they also went back to Delhi. We were always a north centric polity. In the Northern area. The, nobody really crossed the Vindhyas. Vindhyas was like a divide, like Himalayas are between Tibet and us. Vindhyas was, in those old days, when you're walking by foot or by horse or by bullock carts, it was an obstacle to go through those mountains. So it didn't really reach out to us. It didn't flow easily. You know, an Akbar could ride from, from Kabul, come down Atak and come into Delhi in seven, eight days or ten days. He did a march from Ahmedabad to Delhi in nine days. Yes. So uh, that was easy for them. So this was a little distance. And then in those days, you didn't have like, great railway lines or you know roads. So you dominated the area around you. I was reading. So you wrote and thought about what is what is in front of your eyes rather than rather than you know exploring what India was. No, and but the point uh, is the people who collated all yes, that yes. didn't collect us yeah. into it. Mm. So we, if you read any eminent historian, you read um, Tarachand or you read uh, Romila Thapar who is still alive, Irfan Habib, all their books. Asim Ajumdar. All of them. You, know. you see there are hundreds of historians who are listed out in the list of prominent historians of India. Very few of them have written, except for um, Nilakanta Shastri and a few people who wrote about the South. Oh, Nilakanta Shastri's work is still a standard work on um, on on South India. South India. Nobody else wrote. Yes. You know, I'm reading Percival. But that that was in the 40s. The glory, the glory that was in India, Basham and yeah, El Basham and uh, Thapar. Hmm. Nothing on the South. One chapter. 14 chapters on this. And then you spoke about the Northeast. Mm. When did the Northeast come into our consciousness? Mm. Even Aurangzeb didn't go there. Mm. He tried twice. Akbar's expedition failed. Rather, Mansingh was defeated at Saraigat. So only the British first went in 1626. Mm. That to the Treaty of Yandabo with the Burmese. Mm. The Burmese were there. And and then the missionary activity. And missionary activity. Now, when did we keep talking about Nagaland, integral part of India? 
When did Nagaland come into, the Nagas come into our consciousness? When did, so unless you understand all this, you won't have a sense of empathy with the longings of those people or want to make adjustments with them. You know. And even, even after independence and much later after independence, immediately after independence probably, you know, it wasn't uh, the most pressing agenda. But once we settled down after the, you know, partition, partition riots and other things, 50s, 60s, 70s also, somewhere the northeast and the south and various, even in say Kalinga, Odisha and, you know, Gujarat and, uh, you know, the, um, the, 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 the Maratha uh, uh, kingdoms, they, they were not really explored. Marathas were, were a bit more explored yeah. than the, the South Indians, but um, these two parts, the East and the South, they, they were continued to be ignored. The historians did not turn their attention to these parts and universities in the, in the Southern Peninsula, the, the, they have also not really paid much effort and attention because the research agenda, the research funding the Indian Council for Historical Research, they were all somewhere biased, wittingly or unwittingly, knowingly or unknowingly, towards promoting a research agenda which explored more and more of the Northern Indian and Aryavarta. There, there was a geographical bias also, because at that time, we were North centric, mm -hmm. because Hindustan or Bharat or whatever you call it, started somewhere near Kabul. And came down this way, and the whole of Pakistan in between. We we'll take out the fact that you know today there are 220 million people there. The whole big landmass, Pakistan, pretty big geographically, was not with us. Is not with us now, but then was with us. Yes. The integral part of this Indian, pan-Indian consciousness, you call it. Mm -hmm. But now it's not there. So Delhi now becomes Delhi was one central to ruling India. That all other places were equidistant more or less from it, except the south. Now, Delhi is lying in the north, northwest in one corner, distant from all other parts of the country. So, the logic of a capital there is also gone. So, if you look at Delhi, now it is a dominated by the people immediately around it. That's right. You go, even police constables in Delhi are from Haryana or from UP. Punjab. Yes. Punjab. Yes. Nobody, Rest of the country is not represented in Delhi at all. You know, at one time I counted that all seven MPs were from, were Punjabis, came from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Then they started getting some UP people. But the only South Indian who ever won an election from Delhi was CM Stephen. Yeah. From New Delhi because they couldn't accommodate him in Kerala. So Indira Gandhi gave him a seat in, in Delhi. So there's no other community in Delhi. Whereas, you know, there are Bengalis there, there are South Indians there, large communities. Now the Biharis are coming and establishing themselves in East. But, and there is very, look at the gerrymandering. East Delhi is the biggest constituency yes, in India. Yes. So all those guys are packed into one constituency. Yes. It's almost an extension of Haryana. So um, this is how this biases have been continuing in this country. You know, this kind of a historiography, this kind of a looking at India, looking at India's narrative, looking at India's past history has also spilled over into the national movement narrative. Now, I was looking at uh, the Azadi Kamrat Mahotsav, the kind of personalities that were projected. I am not talking about Jawaharlal Nehru, whether he is included or not, is another debate. But when we look at it from you know, the entire country's point of view, you hardly find anybody from the Northeast, you hardly find anybody from Assam, you know, even Gopinath Bordolai was not included. Not included in that, yeah. And you have, you know, very sparse representation from uh, the southern state, whereas the southern part of India was second to none in, in, in sacrifices, and um, in, in um, uh, the leading of the movement um, in, in every uh, way, even even 
prior to the 1857 uh, uh, mutiny or the first war of independence, in we had in, in 1806 in, in Velo. Yes, in, in Velo, in, in Andhra province and you know, in, in Tamil Nadu, there were so many uh, people who have uh, revolted, the local so, rulers so have, have revolted, but none of them finds a place in the, in the historical imagination. Absolutely. And that, I think, you know, I, I come back to this, it comes back to the political place, space we occupy today in India. If you realize now, the South has only become 19% of India. Yeah. And it is population-wise is stagnating. We all come to zero growth now. Yes. Uh, Karnataka is the last holdout. By 2026, that will also be zero. The TFR is, is almost reached, uh, it's reached uh, replacement, rate. replacement rate and then of course it is going to come, so, come down. So, we will have the states of UP and Bihar which will be growing till 2060-2070 at the rate they are going. TFR of 3, Bihar and certain parts of Bihar are 5 and then HDI indexes, some 8 districts of UP are over 70 percent. Hmm. Now, they are badly administered, they are large politically, difficult to administer. So, you know, it becomes a weight on the whole of India. That's right. I think I have been telling, telling people that this is a bigger challenge than China or Pakistan, hmm. how to get this right. Because we are talking about almost 300 million people now. The entire growth of UP alone will be equal to that of the whole of South India in the next 10 years. Mohan, I want to take this point that you raised a bit forward. Um, you mentioned that why can't you know each state have its own you know archaeological site? Absolutely. If you take that point forward, of course, one of course to have uh, an archaeological survey. They have archaeology departments in, in every state, but they are uh, very ill-equipped, very underfunded, very incompetent. Then uh, they politically, they are not seen as important. But I think that kind of a sense has to be infused in the political parties and who are governing the uh, various states. Yeah. It could be northeastern states, it could be South Indian states, it could be any state for that matter. That's one. The second thing is the the universities that are run by the states in, in these different or even central universities run in these states will have to have a very specific historical agenda. A writing of history, researching of history, choice of topics, choice of subjects, you know, what happened, what, you know, we do not have um, uh, departments of history which went into the respective areas ancient history. You know, some work has been done in, 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 in some universities in Tamil Nadu, but other states, they have not really gone into, you know, what what was our ancient history. For instance, if you look at, uh, say, the Abhravati Stupa, Mahachetya, there is hardly any work which was done in Andhra Pradesh about that. Or, or even the Ramapa temple. Ramapa temple for that. And Yes. It all happened recently. Mm -hmm. No, the point is here I am going to an issue which is different. The monolithization of everything. Mm -hmm. You wanted to make education a central topic. Mm -hmm. University Grants Commission, mm -hmm. that's the syllabus, AICT, Indian Medical Council. All of them want to uniformize yeah. everything. Even social sciences. Even research. social sciences. Historical research. Yes. So I think this time has come to break this up. Let the states compete with each other. If I am competing with, if I have to compete economically, why can't I compete in terms of education? Exactly. Why can't, you know, um, Rajasthan offer the best education in India? Mm. And by having its own university system and syllabi, people who write syllabuses who have a system of imparting examinations. I think syllabus will play a very important role in Therefore, this. Therefore, once you have a local syllabi writing, mm. suppose you have Hyderabad. You can't but write about Nagarjuna, you can't but write about Ramapa yes. or you know Kakatiya, Kakatiya mm -hmm. all this. You have to do it. Yeah. 
you can even write about Vijayanagar because it's after there was a linkage. Yes. It was a Telugu rulership though it's in Karnataka now. That's right. Karnataka people can write so much of history. Yes. Tamil Nadu can write so much of history. Now we, it doesn't come because it becomes one chapter otherwise in one guy sitting in Delhi, historical society, he decides that you know all these 19% population will get one chapter. This is one part of it. But you see, I sitting in say Hyderabad or sitting in uh, um, say Madurai or, or sitting in Kojikod or you know sitting in uh, um, Mangaluru, we should know something about Northeast, we should know something about the North. Similarly, if we similar, so desire. Yeah. Similarly, simil we should know. We should yeah. know and they should also know about, see, I do not think anybody in, 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 in the Northeast, anybody in, in Northern India would know or heard about uh, a kingdom or a dynasty called the Zamorin. Absolutely. In Kerala, absolutely. Yeah. They should know. Similarly, we should know. So, th there has to be an integration, but then as you said, I think in a decentralized way, the universities will have to set their research agenda, you know, prosecute that agenda, they should be funded well, just because it is archaeology, just because it is history, you know, the, the governments and the political leadership should not ignore them, Don't they should not think that it is unimportant. You should have therefore you know, regional education systems, that is what I am talking about, hmm. because after all, you know, we are supposed to be a union of states. Look at the constitution. Exactly. It doesn't talk about unitary state. All the attempt has been in the last 70 years to create a unitary state with one language. After all, let's not blame the BJP for Hindi. Start with the Congress party. Exactly. It, it wanted to set up Hindi Prachar Sabhas, wanted to make Hindi. Till DMK and another said, no, you can't bring it here. Then the South began to seize with it, anger. It spread to Andhra and spread to Kerala. So it was put aside. Early days of the Republic. Also, now that attempt has to stop now. True. And that will then impinge on how are we structured economically. You have one national union, one economic union, you can call whatever you call it. Then the tax collection system also will have to change. How you appoint bureaucrats, where they go. All that will have to be start look. We are all structured for a long colonial state. Right from the attempt has been from the time of Emperor Ashoka mm -hmm. to rule India from one place. Yeah. India cannot be ruled from one place. So India has to grow up into different cultural entities together, bound by one common civilization, not bound by one common nationality, which is not there. We are separate nationalities. So we can say we have a common civilization. Yeah. We derive the same kind of values, the same kind this of homogenization of identity. Absolutely. Homogenization of national identity, religious identity, linguistic identity. I think this has to be completely opposed. Absolutely. This has to be pushed back. So coming to you know uh, some kind of a plan of action. I think people from different states, especially from the northeast, from the east and from the south, they should start looking at agenda, economic agenda, historical agenda, research agenda, what are the interests of the states, what are the interests of the regions and what are the equations between the center and the states. Because you see, now increasingly the evidence is now in the public domain that the center is progressively squeezing the financial and economic powers of the states. Absolutely. You can see this in the, in the new trends, mm. the last 10 years particularly, how the states are getting less each year. Mm. When the Finance Commission says you should be getting more, mm. we are about 20 percent less than what the Finance Commission says. Mm. And that shows a tendency towards centralization, mm. whereas if we should be breaking away from that and get and then this whole business of the new finance commission with the new base yeah. of uh, 2011, 2011 completely mischievous, mm. completely meant to reduce, Tamil Nadu lose, has lost 6,000 crores mm. for it, Telangana has lost 3,000 crores for it, yeah. everybody is losing money and you are going to get less, less money in terms of grants, you are going to get less money in terms of projects. 
Now, uh, are we less than them? The question, you know, I might be one small nine district state of Telangana, but I am a state, individual state, I have my rights. As a state, I have rights. I am a I am a part of the union. A citizen of the union. Yes. As a state. Now, those rights have to be respected. And I am a different person from somebody in Haryana is also has to be respected. We are not the same. And the tendency to make us the same is what must be resisted. We have to be different. Our cultures have to be respected. Our histories have to be respected. Therefore, I attach a lot of importance to writing our history. That's right. Because it's very different from their story. That's right. When did we get conquered from across the Vindhyas? Hmm. The question I ask people, and they're not able to answer. We don't know because they Every don't know. Every time there was a, there was an attempt, it was pushed back. Yes. Yeah. And you know the greatest emperor of a certain period, Harshavardhana, hmm. was defeated on the banks of Narmada yes. by Pulakesan too. Yeah. And Pulakesan was in turn defeated by the Pallavas. You can imagine what strength lay behind yeah. in the hinterland. Yeah. The Rashtrakutas defeated the Palas, yeah. the Pratiharas were defeated by Rashtrakutas again in, in Gujarat. Yes. So, all these things are not recorded in our consciousness yeah. that we were, we grew up separately, culturally. So, these were the not, these were not the dominant themes that occupy the Indian imagination about their past. Indian imagination is unfortunately restricted to invasions from the west or migrations I call it. I do not even call them invasions, I call them migrations because they all came and stayed here. The only one fellow who came and stayed and went back is the English. Yeah. Everybody else came and stayed. Yeah. So, they are all migrations and they all got assimilated here. Hmm. So, I think uh, therefore, it is large subject of how to reorganize the union also comes out of this. But you it see what I find there is a there is a trend Mohan that is increasingly revealing itself is now is is now that there is an officially sanctioned history. True. You know certain certain personalities are slowly to be faded away and certain person personalities are to be you know restored and um, certain personalities are shown to be not very patriotic, not very nationalist. And certain people are shown to be what they were not. What, the, what they were not. Uh, there are certain favored personalities. This tendency to write history or airbrush history is a totalitarian concept. You just airbrushed a fellow yeah. Politburo, one fellow's out, yeah. so you just airbrushed him out, yeah. the rest of the Politburo. Even, even photographs are photographs doctored. This is the same attempt right now because even the Congress did it in his own way. They, because it was again a North centric exactly. regime. Yeah. After all, let us not forget the Congress who wanted Hindi hmm. and set up Hindi Prachar Sabha. Hmm. Because even hmm. Rajgopalachari was president of the Hindi Prachar Sabha. So, these guys they eliminated whoever they did not want, they rewrote history hmm. the way they wanted. But these people are trying to do the same thing. Now, people who were uh, accused in the Gandhi murder case, you know, acquittal I always means that there is lack of evidence, does not mean there was lack of guilt. Evidence was not there to convict a person. Now, if you and then you know you had the 75th anniversary, Jawaharlal Nehru did not feature, whereas you know for 40, 50 years he was central to yes. the freedom struggle. After Gandhi, it was always Nehru, not even his father. Yes. And it was clear from then that, you know, he was Gandhi's most favored, trusted man. But suddenly, you airbrush him out, say he does not exist. And then, you forget that he spent 1300 dea days in jail. Yes. And you suddenly say that, you know, he had uh, an air conditioned room, <laughs> you know, in social media it goes. No, this kind that, of that's all the WhatsApp university wisdom that precisely, we Precisely. You know, therefore, I started getting worried when this minister, minister Sharma, um, who was MOS in culture, he was tasked with rewriting our history. So, he said, I am going to start with the Ramayana. Now, how are you going to explain the androids? How are you going to get explain away the monkeys in 
carrying stones. Are you going to say this is how we viewed our tribals or this is how we viewed South Indians? So, it is getting into areas where we should not be getting into. We should be looking at evidence. After all, it is we who forgot Ashoka and the East India Company discovered him for us. Princip discovered him. He was an officer in the mint. He discovered Priyadarshini, Emperor Priyadarshi. And the stupas, and said, This is what the stupas are. About. These are all the pillars are about. Yes. These are for Brahmi. Mm. So, I think we should. Even Amravati stupa was discovered by Mackenzie. Absolutely. We should now get a consciousness of this history. And let us not just throw everything saying that some Englishman wrote it. They did not write it with it. They were pursued curiosity according to what they saw. They did not come here as part of a great design to say that, you know, let us give these people a history. We lost our history because we went into the oral tradition. Or not recording things. Oh, you see, there are there are different kind of uh, things. And certain 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 civilizations have written it down. Certain civilizations haven't carried it orally forward. You know, even our, our greatest scriptures were orally uh, transmitted from one generation to the other generation. So I think, I think, the the especially the eastern and southern parts of the country will have to focus their attention anew on their history, the way the history is written, the way historical research agenda is decided, funded, the way the archaeological monuments and archaeological survey are conducted and preserved and properly funded. I think this has to become some kind of a an important agenda for all these uh, states. And it can be best done by the states. Then, yes. Because they also have a vested interest mm. in projecting their own cultures. And so, I think, you know, therefore, the decentralization must start with these monoliths, mm. looking after culture, looking after education. Syllabus. Syllabuses. Mm. These have to be broken up. Yes. I do not think there should be a syllabus for uh, BA in history being set in Delhi for the whole country from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, mm -hmm. all reading the same nonsense. Yeah. You know, I think everybody is entitled to their own history. So, let us give it to them. Mm -hmm.